Have you been watching a lot of home networking tutorials and you don't really understand what 192, 168 or 255 or class C subnets, you just don't really understand how this is relevant to you that you just want to set up your home network for a secure and reliable internet. Then in this free one hour course, you got to get all of the home networking concepts that you actually need to make the right decisions for your own home. You can find an extended and free version of this course in my platform bundled with my home networking migration that I'm currently doing, moving everything over to this new Unify installation. Today we're going to be looking at IP addresses version 4. So let's start with this sample network that you can see over here. Now this is quite a common network. You can see the router right here above over here. We have different networking devices that we've got specific videos here in this course about it. We've got access points, we've got switches, we've also got some P a PC over here, and we have also a couple of mobile devices. Now you can immediately see in green over here, I've noted out the IP addresses. Now some of these IP addresses are actually real IP addresses in my own home network. Now all of these IP addresses over here have a few characteristics which we're going to explore in detail. For now, one thing that you need to know is that each device that connects to your network, your router, your switch, or your PC, your tablet, any device needs to have an IP address. And you can recognize the IP address with this series of numbers that you can see over here. Now, each IP address needs to be unique, right? So you can't have a 192.168.1.3, we can't have that repeating anywhere else because if that did happen, then we wouldn't really know or you know, the computers wouldn't know where to send the information to because you'll have basically a situation of uh, having the same phone number, uh, having two people with the same phone number. Now let's look at this standard IP address that I'm pretty sure you've seen in many other places in many online tutorials and blogs. 192.168.1.1. So that's how we read it out. We read it out with the dots in the middle. We've mentioned that the IP address needs to be unique, which is true. An IP address always is always 32 bits long. And a bit, if you don't know what a bit is, is basically a zero or one value. So everything in computers basically represented by an on or off, zero and one, one representing on, zero off. So we need 32 bits. We also have four octets. So octets with octet meaning eight. So this is an octet over here. So it's one, two, three, four. So we have four octets and each octet has eight bits. So eight times four equals 32. That's where you get your 32 bits. And decimal means that they're expressed in decimal. What does decimal mean? So decimal is the way humans or me and you actually use numbers. So numbers go from zero to nine and that's the sort of decimal system. And in fact, a 10 is represented with a one and a zero. So those are the actual unique numbers that you can have in a decimal system. So 192 is a decimal number. However, computers use actually a binary notation. So to really understand how IP addresses work, we also need to look and we need to understand how to convert um, decimals to binary. Now, why do we actually care about that? Let's have a look at this in more detail. So when you create your own network, you can actually, so we know we need these four octets, which are represented by the dots. And we know that each octet needs to be eight bit long. So what value can I put over here? Can I just put any random value when I create my own network? We know 192.168.1.1 is sort of standard, but what can we actually do? Well, in general, for version four or, or IPs, basically we can have anything from, well, these, this is the possible maximum range. 
0.0.0.0 and 255.255.255. Now you can't use this whole range of values. This is a range of values. You can't use all of them. Right? And we're gonna go into this course into more details. But just for now, just know that this is the possible ranges of values. Now, now let's look at the binary and decimal conversion. Okay, so let's recap again what's the difference between decimal and binary. Binary is represented by zeros and ones, which we can see over here. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, um, go and find an appliance that has an on and off button and you'll notice this symbol over here. This actually is represented by the zero and the one together. So that's a symbol of on and off, if you didn't know that. And recapping computers, I actually use binary humans, so me and you, we use uh, zero to nine. That's sort of our numbering convention. And that's how we number things. What does this actually mean? So remember we talked about eight bits. Eight bits, so a bit can be formed of two values, right? So it can be zero or one. So this is a little calculator right here at the bottom where we can see all the values expressed, calculated from this formula over here. So two to the power of zero is one, two to the power of one is two, two to the power of two is four. So basic mass, basically two to the power of two is two times two, okay? So two to the power of three would be two times two times two, okay? And so on and so forth. So that's sort of basic mass. So let me give you an example. So we have a decimal number of one, okay? So how does a one represented? So one is actually equates to one byte because eight bits equal one byte, okay? So what we can do, how do we get this? Now this is the calculator, this is the cheat calculator. Now we work from left to right and we look at the number and basically we say, is this number lower than the number that we are trying to convert? So we're trying to convert a one, is 128 lower than one? No, but because we say no, we put zero and basically we continue. So 64, we say no, 32, 16, 80, 14, two, till we get to the one where we can just cross it down. So we've got our binary. So decimal one is actually 0 0.0000001, okay? Now, how do we get to two? So if we wanna find two, let's sort of do this again. So we know that two is lower than anything else, but over here, we would know that the two is here and we don't need this one, so we'll go zero. So in binary, two would be equal to zero, 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 one, zero. So don't say 10, right? So we don't read it like decimals. We read it zero, 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 one, or uh, uh, one, zero at the end. We can just say 10. So this is, um, really uh, useful? Well, we'll find out why this is useful, right? So how this is actually linked back to what we were saying before, where we were looking at the 255 as the maximum possible range. Imagine we have this binary number, eight ones. So eight ones, no zeros. What actually decimal value is that, right? How do we know? Well, we can just do this, right? One, 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 one. So it's the equivalent, right? So it's all those numbers together, which would actually be 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus eight plus four plus three, sorry, plus two plus one to be precise. And all this equals 255. So when we have all ones, meaning that all of them are on. So imagine these are as, as sort of levers. So basically they can be zero or one or on and off. Okay. Then having all of them ones would actually make equal to two, five, five. Now what happens if we have the other situation? We have all of them zero. So we can just basically 
really immediately say that that will be decimal zero. So zeros and 255 are the range that the IP version four actually uses, right? And we know this because of the eight bits. So going back to the main example about the IP addresses. Now we've got our octet. So each octet will be represented by these bits. So we have 192. So if we go back to our um, diagram over here, so 192 would be 128 plus 64. Yeah, so we know that 192 is 128 plus 64. Okay, so that would mean that in binary, this would be 11000000. Remember to have all eight dot. So this would be representing our first octet. This over here equals this. And we can do calculate 168. So if we go back to our diagram and say 168 is 16. So 128 can stay within 168, which is true. So we know that's a one. So we can add one over here. So we know it's 128, but it's not plus 64 because that's 192. So we know we've got a zero because 64 we can't pull, but what about 128 plus 32? So we can use 32 and we get to 160. This point 16, we can't use. So we need to put a zero and uh, eight is the remainder. Basically we will put a one and then three zeros. So now this guy over here, pick it up and copy it, is a representation of 168. Okay, and then so forth, so forth. So we know that the last two are uh, pretty straightforward because they're all 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Now, when do you actually need to set IP addresses? You, we're going to need to set IP addresses and we can look at this when we set static IP addresses, when we set the DNS, when we set the uh, default gateway. So there's a lot of concepts and a lot of places in when we're going to be building our home network where we will be setting IP addresses. The main takeaway for you is that you now know that an IP address formed like 192.168.1.300 basically is, is, is wrong. It can't exist. So there's one more concept we want to cover as part of this lesson. We are two addresses that we cannot use to uh, distribute to hosts. So we, if we pick 192.168.1.0 or .255, just for now know that if, uh, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but I'm assuming this is the notation. So I'm assuming this is a class C IP address. Now we're gonna get to what that means in a separate lesson. But if that is true, then we can't use a zero because this represents the network. And 255 is the, what's called the broadcast, the broadcast address. So you always need to take at least two addresses out of Let's your... look at the properties of IP addresses. The two main distinctions you really need to understand is public versus private and static versus dynamic. Now let's start with public versus private. What you will be actually doing in your home network, you'll be dealing with private, private IP addresses. So these are also called internal or local. Public addresses are actually external. Or global. So let's draw out a quick diagram. So let's say you have numerous hosts, PCs in your network. This is your own network. And over here you have your router. Okay. And over here you have the internet, right? So other computers or anything else going on. So this is your internal LAN. So it's called a LAN and let's say the outward side is called WAN, Wide Area Network and Local Area Network. So your router will have basically two addresses, 
two IP addresses. One will be the public IP address, and over here we'll have a private. And the private IP address could be that famous 192.168.1.1. That is like a standard, and this private IP address is also called the gateway and you'll hear the term default gateway used quite a lot so the your router is your actual gateway to the outside world and you will present yourself with a public ip address but internally you'll have a private ip address so that's the main logic around public and private ip addresses so in our previous lessons we looked at ip ranges so we know that ranges can mathematically start from 0, 0.00 up to 255.255.255. Then we looked at the classes and we are able to understand that zeros to 126 based on the first octet is class A, then we have class B and class C. We actually also have two more classes which are not really used for home networking called class D and class E. So that fills up to the 225. But in terms of public and private, there's something called a private range. So here we have our private range. These are ranges that you can use in your own home. So first of all, to note, they are free of use because private IP addresses, you can use them for free, but public IP addresses, you uh, need to pay for them and you own them. So what are the three ranges that you can use? So from class A, we can go from 10.0.0.0 right up to 10.255.255.255 as you can see in the IP range over here. And we have for class B, this is the range. And we have for class C, um, another range over there. Now you are going to be able to recognize an IP address and figure out is this IP address a private IP address or if it's public. So if it's within the ranges over here, you can figure out if it's private or public and you also know the class. So you can find out the class, you know the CIDR notation, which is something that I explained in my previous lesson with the number of bits. And you also know, based on the notation, how many bits are reserved for networks and how many bits are reserved for hosts. For home, I will be using a class C, which is plenty and like 99.99% .99 of the times, class C is going to be absolutely adequate. Class B and Class A are obviously used for bigger organizations, bigger companies, global companies, um, but that's a whole different uh, type of networking, enterprise networking, which you don't really need to worry about. Now let's go back to the IP address properties and let's look at static IP addresses and dynamic IP addresses. So let's think of two situations. So a situation when you're actually home and where you're at a coffee bar or you're visiting um, any other place, okay? So let's say you have your mobile device represented here and this mobile device at home is configured on a static IP. Now static IP meaning that the IP is always the same. So let's say you say that the static IP is going to be 192.168.1.100. Okay, so it's a perfectly valid IP. We know that because it's in the private network IP range and it's also mathematically within the boundaries of uh, 0 and 255. So it's perfectly acceptable, works really well at home. But as soon as you, if you go to the coffee bar or, or Starbucks or whatever you want to go and you have someone else. So, so home two would be, let's say for example, a guy called Ben, and Ben has an iPhone and he's put it on the same static IP address, right? So we know this works because, because he's on his internal LAN, 
right? So Ben has a LAN and, and this guy over here has a LAN or you have a LAN. Um, so you, it, your device works, right? But if you go and visit a coffee bar, right, both your phones are there, okay? You're gonna clash. There's gonna be a clash between the two because you both have static IP addresses, okay? So in, this is why dynamic IP addresses are really cool. Dynamic IP addresses meaning that you get assigned a number. So dynamic, you get assigned an IP address. Who assigns it? Something called DHCP. So the DHCP server is responsible on giving out, it gives out uh, IP addresses, okay? So the DHCP server gives out IP addresses to hosts and it sort of manages, but it, it does a few things, right? It manages, manages conflict. So imagine you're at a post office, right? And, and there's certain numbers, right? So sometimes in certain places, you'll have a number, there will be a ticket. Maybe the ticket goes to one to 99 and you cut your ticket and you actually know where you stand. So you might be in position 12 and someone else will be in position 18. Now, if two people had the same ticket, so if you had 18 and 18, then who would be first, right? That would confuse uh, people. However, one thing to note that in the second day, the numbers start again, right? So they will start back from one. Eventually, the numbers will go back to one. So how do you do that? Well, that's normally not a problem in a post office because you don't have people staying more than 24 hours, okay? So in 24 hours, this numbering might reset. This concept is sort of used by the DHCP server and it's called lease, lease, right? And you'll see that in your configuration, lease. So lease is the time that a host right, so your computer, the host, the time that the host gets to keep the same IP address, okay? Now, there's something else, so this sort of continues, okay? So the DHCP over here, there's something called reservation, reservation, right, and this actually means what it means, right? You can reserve the same number. That means that you get the host gets same number. And because the reservation is done by the DHCP server, it is not going to double book. So we don't want double booking because if we have double booking, we have the same problem of before, we have a conflict. So the reservation um, gives us the host gets the same number each time. The good, cool thing about reservations and why I love reservations is because that if we in our browser, so when you go to your browser um, and we use, use the URL, for example, you go and visit a website. So you can visit a website in your internal um, IP range. So you can say 192.168.1.50. And this could be a NAS. It could be a Home Assistant server. If you use Home Assistant, it could be any, any server that you have on your network. And you will know that that will not change. That will stay, stay exactly the same. Okay, so that's good. That means that you don't have to guess what um, IP address the DHCP server has actually issued um, based on lease and based on current conflicts. So let me recap then this lesson again. So static versus dynamic. Static IP addresses that are done on the device level would work if you are very good at knowing that you're not gonna set the same device with the same static IP address and it works very well in your own home, but as soon as you leave your home and this is not practical, you go to a coffee bar, you go to 
any other place that you have a bunch of other people. You might have a clash if you have two people basically on the same IP address or if the DHCP server over here has already given out that IP address to someone else. Um, so we had a look at how dynamic, uh, so how does it work? So this DHCP server, the dynamic host uh, control protocol, gives out IP addresses to hosts and they give it out for a certain time based on something called lease, which you can configure as a network administrator. And the lease, mainly sometimes 24 hours, that means that the device holds the um, IP address, okay? And it manages conflict. So we talked about the example of a post office numbering system, one to 99, people coming in, uh, doing what they need to do. If you have two people with the same number, causes a problem. However, it's uh, also, we can't have numbers going up to, uh, it, we can't have infinite numbers. Because as we know, um, we actually have a limited uh, amount of space. So we will only have, we only have 250 free assignable hosts, right? So if we have a huge lease time, then if we're giving out lease for like a month, then if you have a lot of people go, coming and going, you'll have a problem because you really got to finish your pool of IP addresses. Now, last concept I want to touch is um, DHCP pool. So the pool, so remember the post office example, we said numbers go through one to 99. It's just the series of numbers, right? So most of the time, the dot one IP address is the router. That's the default, right? Okay. And we know we can't use 2, 225, we sort of can't use, because that's the broadcast address. So we have basically a pool. Now default pool could be anything from dot two to dot two five four. You could change this. I mean, I currently have the, from dot 100 to dot two five four and everything between dot two and dot 100 I'm setting um, as static, static infrastructure. So you could do whatever you want with your DHC, DHCP pool. It's up to you to configure obviously within the limits of math. So you have your, you have your upper limit over here and you have those, uh, you need at least one IP address for your router. Your router, to point out, really doesn't have to be on dot one. It could be on any. You might be asking yourself this question: Why haven't we run out of IP addresses? Now, in IP address version four, remember from previous lessons that we've said that the IP range is from 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 up to two five five two five five two five five. Okay, and we know that there are certain ranges for public addresses and certain ranges for private addresses. And because the public addresses need to be unique, then how come we haven't run out already of IP addresses? Now, just to give you the, the quick answer, there are more than 4 billion IP version 4 address, addresses, which seems a lot. But nowadays, if you think how many IP uh, devices, how many internet devices you have in your own home, and there are more than uh, 4 billion people on earth, and pro probably certain people that have at least 100 devices for themselves, plus all of the business and the companies and, and, and everything else that happens, right? So we would have run out of IP addresses now. If I'm not wrong, I think officially, IPv4 IP addresses ran out in um, 2011. Correct me if I'm wrong, let me know the actual history. So this um, IP version 4 was invented in the 1970s when the internet wasn't actually called the internet. So that's to give you a little bit of a background of why um, we are talking about NAT today. So NAT is the network address translation. And what it actually does, um, it translates IP addresses 
okay, to preserve the limited amount of public addresses that I just talked about. And literally it just does that. You have your private addresses over here and these are behind routers. So router is, is again something that um, sort of holds the, the network address translation table and public um, IP addresses, so IP addresses that sit outside of your uh, home LAN actually are able to interact with devices within your LAN and vice versa through NAT. This is um, the idea of NAT. So if you hear about NAT, um, that's what it is. Now, looking slightly forward in the future, we have another version of uh, IPs, if you haven't uh, heard this before. If you run an IP config of, on your terminal, you'll see a lot of information, uh, this specifically for Windows, but there's similar commands for Max Linux, uh, obviously. And uh, you can also find this out from your network settings and you'll see your IPv6 IP address. And the way that the IP version six address is actually done, it gives us 340 under cillion IPs, which is like a number, it's a huge number, it's much more than trillions, which was the, the, the one, what I actually knew about. To give you some context, um, I think for each, there, there's an IP for each sand uh, granule, right, in the world. So we're not gonna run out of these anytime soon. So theoretically, we won't need NAT anymore in the future. Now, future, what does this mean? Well, you will find that this is terribly difficult to convert everyone and all companies and big organizations. And basically, it will be a new internet. So removing the internet and creating the internet um, to this new IP version six is hugely complex topic. IP version six isn't something new, it's been around for decades. Um, it was predicted that IP version 4 would be gone, gone way, way back. But we're still in 2022 uh, and it's still relevant uh, IP version 4. And that's basically how we do networking, home networking. So that's why I'm, I'm always talking about IP version 4. And I'm just mentioning IP version 6 just as a, you know, you know it exists and you broadly understand the future and the potential. Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're gonna to talk about a topic called DNS. Now the title of this lesson is called What Does CNN or BBC.co.uk or Facebook.com actually mean to a computer? Do they actually mean something, right? DNS, now DNS is very similar name to DHCP. They are two different services, they work in tandem, and they normally both, uh, they get muddled up, uh, let's say, by uh, starters. So don't really too much forget, uh, don't concentrate too much on the name itself, but think of about the question that we're trying to answer, okay? So simply, simple terms, the question is, computers do not really talk in the way we talk as humans. As you can see over here from my diagram, humans, we simply like using names to refer to things, right? So we use things like uh, CNN.com. We name people with their names, right? So people, someone's called John or Ben, depending on which country you live in, okay? You don't name people based on a, a unique identifier, okay? That could be whatever code we, we make up. So sometimes in sci-fi movies, you see robots addressing themselves uh, with numbers, right? And that's sort of the idea. So computers uh, love to work on numbers and we've figured out that in networking, now um, I think that's quite clear after a few lessons, that a lot of it is basically nearly everything's based on IP addresses. So computers love IP addresses, but humans love uh, name. So we struggle with numbers. We used to have to memorize phone numbers, for example. Nowadays, you would just look up someone's name on your smartphone, right? So you don't really need to memorize numbers anymore. We hate memorizing numbers. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we solve the problem by actually having something called DNS. And what DNS does 
maps IP addresses, which sit over here, to uh, the main name. So if you type in into a URL, facebook.com, then you will immediately go to facebook.com. Now, this is not to be confused with a Google search, which Google search will then give us a lot of pages to click on, but ultimately you always click on a website. You're here watching this course, so probably you've clicked on leonardosmartomakers.com, and that is, say exactly as facebook.com, it's its own domain, right? So this is called a domain, okay? leonardosmartomakers.com has an IP address, most likely, um, especially big, large organizations have um, IP ranges. So this is not just Facebook IP address, it's a range. Other advantage of, of DNS from a uh, networking point of view is the fact that uh, you can actually um, change your IP address, right? So if um, everyone was typing in this sequence of numbers into their browser to get to Facebook, and then Facebook decided to want to uh, change those servers, right, or, or, or do some sort of mapping, they would struggle to do that, right? They couldn't do that. And that will mean a lot of people will not be able to access their services and they'll lose a lot of money. Now, uh, you might think, well, that's not too bad. We don't, we don't, we don't care too much about that. How is that impacting uh, our home network, okay? So, um, we uh, nowadays it's very common to use public public DNSs, okay. And the public DNSs I've got some examples over here of um, nowadays at the time of recording. These are sort of the DNS servers. Remember, DNS is actually a server that exists somewhere. And to hit the server, you need to punch in these IP addresses, and you can punch these IP addresses in when you're creating your network. So when we're gonna go and create our network in Unify, in my example, but in basically any network that you have control of and you can create, you should be able to um, use these public DNSs to actually do the real translation. Really important thing in, in, in the old days, at least let's say a decade ago, you were able to hack, hack this, right? So there, was, there were files on Windows where you could basically, uh, there was a local DNS host, the host file, I think it was called. And in this host file, what you could do is, you could just uh, make up IP addresses. So you could say that if you could map Google, right, .com and map it to some sort of malicious IP, okay? bad IP or or like a copy of google.com and then in there you have whatever some other stuff right so maybe not with Google you would do it for example as sort of bank and so you can capture information right very bad stuff so to avoid this um, the popularity and the adoption of the public DNSs and obviously the speed that we can now contact public DNSs um, sort of uh, that's one that's how they use I have a cool uh, thing to do. Uh, there's a little uh, service called uh, Ping, and you've probably seen this or heard about it, but Ping basically sends uh, packets to IP addresses. So imagine you have your computer over here, okay, and it's sending these little packets, and it's trying to basically contact the server. And one common way of, of testing that your internet connection actually works in a bit of a cool way. So open up a terminal and type in P-I-N-G, ping, and then you can pick any of these uh, public DNS servers which are always available, 1.1.1.1 for Cloudflare, Google, or Quant9, okay? So I hope that helps you with uh, DNS, of how DNS works. It helps you understand how the internet works in general. It's a really important buzzword that you uh, bump into in many tutorials and blogs and videos. But uh, this is the key point over here. When you go and design your own network, you can pick your own uh, DNS uh, service that you want to use. Hey guys, welcome back to the course. Now we're gonna look at TCP, TCP. The TCP protocol, you must have heard, TCP slash IP, right? So 
very briefly, a little bit of history. Uh, back in the day, this was like in the 1970s, okay? Computers couldn't actually talk to each other. So we had a point where it was not possible to communicate from, for example, uh, my computer over here to the server over here. You couldn't communicate, okay? So what was agreed was a model, a protocol, a set of rules that govern how uh, computers actually talk to each other. And the TCP protocol was the one that was picked after uh, many debates. However, OSI, which is, uh, was another model that was considered, nowadays is, is used um, also more from a, a network engineering, a theoretical point of view to explain the actual process. So we're gonna go through an example of a communication and then we're gonna talk about the actual layers and what things happen. And then we're gonna try and link it back to home networking and how this applies to us in general when we are trying to design our home network. So we start from a browser. So many interactions with the internet happen with the browser and the browser lives on the application uh, protocol, sorry, the application layer. So you can see the application layer is the highest level if we're starting from top and we're gonna go down bot to bottom. We talked about uh, HTTPS and HTTP also in the ports lesson. If you haven't watched it, go and watch that. But basically, this is what we're doing. We, we are using these protocols to initiate our communication, okay? And the communication is gonna travel through here. So it's gonna go through my switch, okay? It's gonna to go to my router, I remember. It's, so in, at this stage, we're in our private LAN. And then from the LAN, we cross over to a WAN. You know, we cross through the internet and we ultimately get to another LAN. On the other end, there's another switch and there's a server, okay? And the server will reply and give us a, the response. So you can see marked in a different color, the OSI model. So the um, TCP model actually goes from application straight to transport, but the OSI model is gonna explain two more steps that actually happens. One is encryption. So we need to encrypt whatever we send over, and we do that through SSL, because we wanna keep our connection secured and the sensitive data and all sorts of things. And we also convert files. So we ensure that the files are converted in the same format. This is obviously happening uh, we don't actually do anything physically. This is what's happening in the journey. We also establish a session, a connection. That is, uh, you can imagine that like basically me going and saying, hello, hello, you know, when you answer the phone and you're establishing a connection, you, you're trying to acknowledge each other. Um, so opening the connection is the main thing over here. And L L2TP, mainly used for VPNs, it sort of uh, happens at this layer. This is just for your knowledge, okay? Then we go to the transport layer. The transport layer is what we've been talking about mainly uh, around in this course. So we've been talking about how um, IP addresses work and how, uh, you know, ports work in the other lessons. But let's look at the TCP and UDP. So TCP and UDP are two common ways in which you can uh, decide how to send data. Imagine the equivalent of being uh, basically like a post office. So you can send a letter, at least here in the UK, with a stamp and just put it in, or you can send it signed and delivered um, and, you know, different methods of sending data. So if we look at the TCP and how TCP sends its data across, um, it uses, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of complexity around here, so I'm gonna try and simplify this. But basically there's a header with some information in it. And we sending a, a sync message to a, a computer A, which is initiating a conversation with uh, a communication with computer B, will send the sync message, and then if the B receives it, they'll send back a ACK, um, which is a, an acknowledgement message, and, and then the communication continues. So it's more like uh, we would just you know, start a conversation, hello, hello, or like, can you hear me? Um, or you're on mute, you know, nowadays uh, through video calls. But UDP, what it does is, it just basically starts uh, sending data across. It doesn't really care 
too much if B is replying or not. It's just sending data back and B sends data back to A in the same way. So you can have connections that start with TCP, then move on to UDP um, very easily. So an example um, about differences, for example, if we're transferring a file, a document, we, want, we need the whole document to be um, preserved. So we would use uh, TCP, right? TCP would be used. But if we are gaming online or we're streaming a video and we're watching something live, you don't really, you know, it's gone, it's gone. You're more interested to catching up on something that's live than trying to recoup the packet you've lost. Um, so that would like be poor, poor user experience. So that's why we go for, you, you, there's a, you know, streaming videos and gaming are like uh, a UDP activity. So that's the way we move data across, how we transport it across. Then obviously there's the network layer, which is all about uh, routing and IP addresses. So this is a layer three, just to let you know, this uh, over here was layer four. So if we look at our diagram, we have a uh, layer three. So if we look at our diagram, we have layer three, and this is represented by the router. So the router does that IP uh, translation and enables multiple subnets to interact. And it also uh, via NAT, which we've got a specific video on NAT, if you don't know what NAT is, converts uh, private and public addresses, right? So basically each of these devices sort of talk in a different language, okay? Switches, we'll talk at layer two. So switches really don't care about IP addresses, right? They don't, they don't really talk that language. They talk a simpler language, right? So that's a link, uh, layer number two, the data link. And switches use MAC addresses. So each device that you have will have a MAC address and it will know um, which MAC address sits on which and it will know which MAC address sits on which port. So now that port one has these MAC addresses, you know, whatever the MAC addresses are, and, and it will uh, deal with that. And then it actually physically will send the um, communication via ethernet cables, okay? And you can see that sort of represented over here in you know, the physical line of the physical actual data moving across the Ethernet cables. So this is an overview of the TCP um, model and the OSI model baked in at the same uh, point. Why this is uh, significant or, or important or not, this also will help you understand um, switches. So there are layer two, there are also layer three switches you can buy that would act at a higher level of abstraction and will um, act basically like a router. So that's uh, to give you a bit more theoretical knowledge and uh, um, obviously now we're going to talk about ports. Now, ports are uh, something that you probably have encountered many times, especially if you've been doing tutorials and watching videos online. The way you actually see a port, you normally see it over here. So let me give you this example of an IP address. You see IP address. Uh, this is my actual local private IP address for Home Assistant, my um, smart home automation platform of choice. And you can see the actual port is defined by this colon over here. And the port is 8123. Okay, so that is the port that on which the server that I have, so I have a server with Home Assistant on, right, and installed on the server, the actual port that it's giving out is 8123. So on that server, so this is the HA server I have in my uh, NAS cabinet, um, in my, sorry, my rack cabinet, that actually could have multiple things installed on it, right? It doesn't have to be uh, just one. Hence, ports are quite useful. An analogy for ports that I want to give you, imagine you have an apartment complex, a building or um, a business and um, you want to send a message or a letter or a parcel and most commonly you can pinpoint the actual building and this could be represented as an IP address, for example, but then within the building we were just going to go specifically to uh, a specific letterbox and this could be represented uh, basically as a port 
okay? So they're how these ports are actually numbered, right? The, the, they are common ports and these are ports that you either know by already by heart, but this is uh, quite useful in the whole TCP model. So if you haven't watched the TCP and OSI uh, video lesson that I've made, uh, go and watch that because these are sort of linked. So in uh, layer four, so just to recap the uh, layers. So in the transport layer over here, where we start using TCP and UDP, at that point, we start talking about ports. So ports come in and it depends on the application that we actually use, there are reserved ports. So HTTP and HTTPS, which are used for web browsing, which you've probably seen in your uh, URL. Predominantly, they use TCP and they sit on port 80 and port 443. The, H, the S for HTTPS, if you didn't know, means stands for secure. So this is more of a secure connection, encrypted connection. Now you can see our services, the file transfer protocol FTP sits on 21, SSH, uh, you use that for terminal, sits on 22, DNS that we have a separate lesson for, 53 and DHCP, uh, 67 or 68. So there are actually quite a lot of well-known ports and you can see them, they range from zero to 1023. Those are the well-known ports. The registered ports, those ones that uh, have been uh, are reserved, okay, are from uh, 1024 to 49,151. And dynamic ports are basically everything else up to 65,535. So those are the range of ports. Now, when we actually make a request, we normally use the IP colon port. So an HTTP request could be uh, 80 or 8080, okay? So when we actually send that across to the server, we actually receive back the uh, IP address of the server, okay? And we would get a destination port. So normally destination ports are the ones that you see ranging in the, like for example in this in these dynamic ranges. So this is sort of what this actually means. It's the port that we get back when we have a response. This is more foundational um, knowledge for you but in terms of your home networking design where do you actually need to know about this? This comes in when you're doing firewall rules. When you're doing firewall rules and when you're blocking uh, access from different services, okay? For example, you could decide to block FTP and SSH but allow HTTP and HTTPS. And because you, you start learning about the uh, different ports and the different protocols that the ports actually use, which you can refer to my previous session about TCP and UDP, then um, you can make well-known decisions. So when you're actually following an online tutorial about the firewalls and they're talking about ports and what they're restricting, you sort of have a bit of more of an idea of what ports actually mean and uh, you're more, you can make more conscious decisions. I hope you enjoyed this one. Right, so See today you. we're going to look at how devices actually talk to the internet and specifically we're going to be looking at the default gateway. So the default gateway is something you might have heard a lot about and I'm really going to simplify it. it I, most of the times we're talking about a router. Okay, so router is uh, what you configure. You probably got to have this in your own home. It normally is provided by an ISP, so the internet service provider. So basically the company that you pay for your broadband or your internet access at home they will normally issue with a standard router. What I'm doing in this course, I'm using a, um, basically I had a USG and I'm using some Unify equipment and I'm replacing that with the Dream Machine, the UDM. But apart from that, the important point to uh, convey is that the router gives us access to the outside world. So we have N number of hosts represented by these little squares. They all connect to the router and the router basically gives us internet access. 
Remember from previous lesson that each uh, device, so the router and these hosts over here need a IP address, okay? So we all, or everyone needs an IP address. So really what we need to specify, and what is the default gateway? It's the IP address of the router. And we can pick any, any address in range. And we've talked about the range in separate videos, what are the possible ranges depending on uh, the network you have, okay? So let me give you a little bit of a scenario. So imagine we have our standard LAN, then we have multiple networks. So we have a network for IoT, we have a guest network. And let's say we are using standard 192.168 and we have the 1.1. So I'm not going to be repeating this all, but imagine we have um, .10.x, .10.1, let's say guess is .20.1. Okay, so these are our IP addresses. Um, so these are our default gateways. Okay, so each network has uh, the default gateway that it actually points to. So all connections will point back to this one over here which actually all point to the same device, which will be that router that we specified earlier. Now a crucial thing to understand is that the um, interaction between these different subnets, and they are living on a different octet, if you remember, these interactions actually happen via the router, okay? So you need a router basically to uh, network between different subnets within your own environment, but also with the wider internet that sits uh, over here. Now the convention is to use dot one, but as that is the convention and the default that you get out of the box, uh, a lot of malware, malware basically it's software, but for bad purposes, we could say like vi viruses and things like that. So malware normally if they're trying to target a network, the simple ones, the simplistic ones, will go with the most common addresses. So if you're trying to attack uh, the router, it probably will go on 192.168.0.1 or .1.1. And these are the most common ones. So if you pick anything apart from .1 as your default gateway, you're immediately increasing your security. And same really for 254, which is sort of another standard number. So I wouldn't pick the last two numbers, to be honest, but really up to you, do your own research in terms of uh, malware and best practices. I'm gonna be picking a random number for the router. Best to pick either a low, or high number, and this is because of the DHCP reservation. If you want to know a little bit more about that, then follow the lesson at the DHCP reservation. I hope you enjoyed this one, and see you next one. Hey guys, today we're going to talk about something that most of you are really familiar with, wireless Wi-Fi access. And we're going to cover the basic points, and then we're going to go a little bit more technical, and this will really help you in deciding how many access points you're going to need, how to structure your Wi-Fi network. I'm going to be obviously showing you how I'm doing it in Unify, but it's also help you with the different devices and purchasing devices. Okay, so let's go straight into it. So the sound of the design you can see over here, we have something called WAP. That just stands for wireless access point. Now in many routers, the ones that come with your, uh, provided by your internet service provider, your ISP, you have your wireless bands uh, within the same device. So it'll be all, all one device. But the networking that we are looking to do here in this home networking course is we're actually having a dedicated device and it's a round device, the one I have. And this dedicated device, the sole purpose of this device is to distribute wireless signal to our mobile devices, which you can see represented over here. How does this actually work? 
well, this is thanks to physics and bands and frequencies. We're not going to go too much into it, but just for your knowledge, you have two main frequencies, 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. 5 gigahertz is the faster one. However, 2.4 gigahertz is used um, mainly also for coverage range and uh, penetration. So the, basically a signal through uh, obstacles like walls, 2.4 travels better. Now, certain devices, so each device you have can be compatible or not with both. Now, modern devices like uh, smartphones, tablets will be compatible uh, with both wireless uh, signals. But if you go and look at some sort of cheap, um, you know, IoT little chip, uh, Wi-Fi chip, most likely they will be compatible only with the 2.4 gigahertz. And also to be fair, they don't really require the speed of the five gigahertz. So that also makes sense. Talking about speed, let's look at different wireless standards that are represented over here. Now the wireless uh, Wi-Fi has had several iterations. The current iteration um, is Wi-Fi 6. Now what I mean by current, I mean that is, is basically consumer grade. Okay, so it's got to the point where a consumer, me or you, can go out and buy a Wi-Fi 6 access point and can buy um, some devices that are Wi-Fi 6 compatible. For example, new uh, MacBooks, the M1 MacBooks uh, are compatible with Wi-Fi 6. I don't really have, um, I don't think I have any Wi-Fi 6 compatible devices at the time of the recording, but soon I will be moving to Wi-Fi 6. So Wi-Fi 6, you can say, is the new standard, even if, uh, as you can see over here, it was introduced in 2019 as a sort of the technology. It takes time from it being invented and discovered and, and the standard created for Wi-Fi 6 is 802.11ax. And you can see the super promising maximum speeds of 10 and 12 uh, gigabits per second. So that's a huge jump from the current standard. I would say most people currently have uh, 802 dot 11 ac devices which were called wi-fi 5 and you can see the sort of the big difference between the two uh, there seems to be a quite significant jump other concept i want you also to focus on is the uh, mu mio mimo multi-user multiple input multiple output so basically we have users so user is represented by a mobile device and you have your wireless access point over here and they communicate, right? So you might have many of these around here. And everyone's trying to communicate with the access point at the same time. So multiple users basically means how many people, how many people can the, how many devices can the access point deal with at the same time? So you might have two uh, devices and this number is represented by two by two or four by four, for example, these are the streams, right? The, the users, and then it's the inputs and outputs. So actual user um, can send multiple signals, right? And it can receive multiple signals also going that way. So the obvious one is the higher, the better. So the more you have, so four by four is reasonable. I've gone with a, a wireless access point, the Wi-Fi six one, which we'll be looking into um soon once you sort of get it uh, installed um, i believe it's a two by two which should be plentiful and adequate for my use case you will probably not see a difference between two by two and four by four in your home so cool so i hope you enjoyed it and you know a little bit more about wi-fi and how wireless works wow that was quite a long course i hope you really enjoyed it Remember, if you want to find out more about this course and all the other courses that are on the platform, there's a link in the description below for the Smart Home Makers platform. And now I'm going to link you to my next video, my net home networking tour. If you can't see this video, subscribe because it will drop soon. See ya. Ciao.